Unitarianism was a religion on the rise in the 1800s. And American Unitarianism was unique from Unitarianism in other parts of the world. In Europe, Unitarianism was mainly a movement that proclaimed one God rather than the three-in-one God of the Christian Trinity. But Unitarianism came to have uh, its identity in the United States largely as a counter to the hateful brand of Calvinism that was so prominent early in the United States history. That Calvinist Christianity taught that God chose who would go to heaven and who would go to hell before people were born, that a fiery pit awaited most people after they died, and that the only way to know whether you were going north or south was whether you did good works in the world. Hence, and this is a little bit of a rabbit trail maybe, the creation of the Puritan work ethic. Take God out of that equation, and it's not so far from the current state of American culture. The busier we are, the more righteous we are seen to be, while the misfortunes of the poor are blamed on their lack of work ethic. Puritanism dies hard, but I digress. The Unitarians had a life-saving message that was tailor-made for their time. God is not hateful, but loving. You are not sinful, but full of potential. And God is found not up in the sky someplace, but in each of us, in and between and around us. But while the content of Unitarianism was energizing, the forms into which that content was poured weren't always so jazzy. Unitarian preachers and theologians used obscure Bible verses to prove their sometimes convoluted theological propositions. Ralph Waldo Emerson took to calling his fellow Unitarians corpse cold. <laughs> Around the, some of us still haven't forgiven him for that, by the way. <laughs> Around the 1830s, the transcendentalists, both here and in Europe, began to argue that people didn't need biblical proof texts or other religious forms any longer. As Jeff, Jeff Wilson wrote in uh, our denomination's periodical magazine, Unitarian Universalist World, a few years ago, the central tenet of the rising transcendentalist cadre was that human beings contained within themselves a mysterious internal principle that guided them toward religious truth, an intuitive capacity more profound and reliable than scriptures, ecclesiastical institutions, or traditions. This spiritual sixth sense pointed toward transcendental truths such as the universal kinship of people, the ability of the human individual to commune directly with the divine and the presence of the sacred in the manifestations of the natural world. That thinking took hold in American Unitarianism. Some historians have called transcendentalism a reform movement within Unitarianism, at least in part. Unitarian ministers began denying Jesus' miracles. They took on texts other than the Bible. Some of them started communes. You can read about that, sometimes wacky history. <laughs> Transcendentalists formed clubs and held salons to debate their ideas. And the Transcendentalists had influence over some of the most important institutions in America. Famously, in 1838, Ralph Waldo Emerson was invited to deliver the commencement address at Harvard Divinity School. The Divinity School there had become an important center for Unitarianism, and there was all this tension between the old school, exclusively Christian, Bible-based Unitarians and these upstart transcendentalist Unitarians. Emerson, who would soon leave Unitarian ministry, in fact, in the time between accepting the invitation to speak and speaking, he left Unitarian ministry, <laughs> but so he came in all hot and bothered and charged. He used his address to preach transcendentalism to the graduating Unitarian ministers. Here are a couple of paragraphs. I want you to imagine that you're a brand new minister, maybe part of this new movement in your faith and maybe a more traditional Christian Unitarian, or imagine that you're a professor, even better, <laughs> having spent your entire life teaching ministers to model their work on theologians and ministers long dead, maybe even you. And you hear this from Emerson. Let me admonish you, first of all, to go alone, to refuse the good models, 
even those which are sacred in the imagination of men, and dare to love God without mediator or veil. Friends enough, you shall find, who will hold up your emulation, uh, to your emulation, Wesleys and Oberlin's, saints and prophets. Thank God for these good men, but I say I also am a man. Imitation cannot go above its model. The imitator dooms himself to hopeless mediocrity. The inventor did it because it was natural to him, and so in him it has a charm. In the imitator, something else is natural, and he bereaves himself of his own beauty to come short of another man's. This is a great line. I I haven't yet found a way to use it. Yourself a newborn bard of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that great? (laughs) Cast behind you all conformity and acquaint people at first hand with deity. Look to it first and only that fashion and custom and authority and money are nothing to you. But live with the privilege of the immeasurable mind. End quote. He was asking all those newly minted ministers, if God is everywhere, including mostly in you, why look to sources outside yourself? Why not find the divine within where it clearly resides? And why not point people in the congregations you're about to go serve into themselves for guidance, for a connection to the holy? Now, I think there are good answers to that question. Why not? I, I've had some dingbat ideas. No amens here, please. And I'll bet you have too. And it helps to be in a community of people who can lovingly suggest that, hey, that's a dingbat idea. <laughs> Maybe by voting. Or worse, that's an action that is hurtful. And two, let's be real. This is my line on Emerson. I think I've said it to you before. Emerson preached about not listening to preachers to rooms full of people who had gathered to listen to him preach. (laughs) He got paid to do that, as a matter of fact. Thoreau, yes, spent a lot of time alone at Walden Pond, but he also went into town now and then to have somebody else cook for him and do his laundry. Human beings simply cannot live on our own. We need one another. There was some degree of hot air being expended by these people. But what was at the core of their message was life-saving and remains true. It is what is at the center of modern-day Unitarian Universalism, too, I believe. Namely, that we human beings can be trusted. That we are, at our cores, not bad, not sinful, but full of potential. We know how to pursue the good and right inherently in the right environment. We can be trusted. For me, over a decade ago, that was the saving message of Unitarian Universalism. I was raised in a religion, as many of you know, in which I was repeatedly told that God was going to burn me alive for eternity. They didn't say it that way. I do. For just about every fun thing I ever did or wanted to do. (laughs) Drinking, swearing, sex, gambling, not praying enough, not reading the Bible enough, arguing with my parents, reading too many books that weren't the Bible, dancing, and sex again. <laughs> I, even, I even got into trouble uh, for listening to a cassette tape of Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show in junior high. I know now that I should have chosen a better band to suffer eternally <laughs> for. It, it seemed like God's main mission was to control us to keep us from straying from the path because anything outside that narrow path was fraught with traps and danger. The world and certainly the afterlife seemed like a dangerous place because I was born tainted by sin. I was told I couldn't be trusted to find my own way and that was supposed to make me grateful to this vengeful meddling God. That religion, it did call for transformation, but it was transformation from the bad person I was told I was, a person whom God couldn't even stand to look out without making a sacrifice of his own son, to a person who had said the right prayer and could now be accepted in God's sight. Now, maybe most people's religion isn't so upfront about it, but that's the message of a lot of American religious groups. People are bad. God is good. If you beg, you can be forgiven. 
As you might imagine, that God is in the rear view for me, has been for a long time. But when I was leaving that particularly hateful brand of Christianity, I thought at first I would have to leave all the things I loved about religion. The careful consideration of deeply held values, the community that supported me and my family in our toughest times, until I found Unitarian Universalism. In this faith, I felt for the first time that I had room to grow beyond certain boundaries. I felt trusted with my own path. Even though I still longed for challenge and conversation and spiritual growth, I felt the burden of control finally lifted. I still identify as a Christian Unitarian Universalist, but now it's because I value the teachings of Jesus and his martyrdom as a prophet of love. My faith is free from fear. I feel I can be trusted with my own journey. So that is the kind of transformation the transcendentalists still call us to. Not some divine transformation of our sinful natures, but transformation to a kind of faith, to a kind of living that acknowledges the inherent, inherent worth and dignity of every single person. There is nothing from which we are born needing to be saved. We can be trusted with what is best for us. We can be trusted with our own gender identities and laws telling us which bathrooms to use or what documents we have to carry around are nonsense. We can be trusted to know whom we love and any attempts to stop people in love from marrying are rooted in that old religious idea of Bible-based control. We can be trusted to tell our stories and find our way because all we know of divinity is found not in heaven somewhere but in the hearts and minds of every single person we will meet. That includes children. That was one of the noticeable changes for me when I transferred into Unitarian Universalism. I spent most of my childhood memorizing the Bible, I, my, the religious part of my childhood. I spent a lot of time memorizing that text. I'm still really grateful for that, by the way, largely because I can see the biblical underpinnings of what goes on in our culture. But the goal was to have me know what the Bible said about how I was supposed to live my life and what would get me to heaven. We here side more naturally with the philosophy described by Khalil Gibran in a reading that's in our hymnal. He says, your children are not your children. They're the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you but not from you, and though they're with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. I have kids, as you can tell. (laughs) Even in children... We can trust that when we create safe, nurturing environments and offer information appropriate to their ages, the human spirit will respond just as it should. Thus, in addition to teaching you, you values in our faith formation programs, we also invite children into into experiencing uh, the faith homes of our neighbors. There's nothing to fear. The human spirit knows what it needs. This is the reason we Unitarian Universalists talk about siding with love and about acting on love in our society. Not just because we think we should be nice to everyone, although I'm not sure what's wrong with that, but because this religion has for centuries proclaimed that people can be trusted to manage their lives. And I'll be honest, sometimes it gets on my little Midwestern nerves. We contend toward every single person as a special butterfly in the universe kind of thinking. (laughs) Or maybe it's more like Lake Wobegon where all the children are above average. (laughs) But even on our most flighty days, I will take this transcendentalist life-affirming faith over all the draconian efforts at control and shaming that we see 
Every place from local faith homes to the halls of our legislature. I am proud to be a Unitarian Universalist. I'm proud to be connected to all those transcendentalists who reformed this movement for our sake. Friends, we do need to grow all our lives long. We aren't born mature, but we are born with dignity and worth and potential. And whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey, may you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that although you may not be perfect, you are loved, you are valued, you are trusted. Amen.